Good morning, dear friends, and welcome to the second day of the Ocean Lecture Hall within the Ocean and Climate Science events, which we dedicate to the launch of the United Nations Decade on Oceans and Climate for Sustainable Development. If you are watching this video as recorded, don't forget that you have a unique opportunity to submit questions in writing in the box below, and we will publish them on our website www.univer.ist.su Our first lecture today presented by Susie Grant, a marine biogeographer from the British Antarctic Surveys. The topic is Research and Monitor in Antarctic Marine Protected Areas. Welcome, Susie. Thank you very much indeed, Lena. Good afternoon, everyone. Dobre dien. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you. Um, and thank you all very much for um, joining us for this lecture. It's it's a real pleasure to have the chance to speak to you. Um, I'm very grateful to Elena, um, Alexandra. Thank you very much to Andre um, for providing this. Um, I didn't know until yesterday that this was possible on Zoom, so I, I think this is really amazing and I'm um, excited to see this um, working so well. Um, my name is Susie Grant. Um, as Lena said, I'm a marine biogeographer at the British Antarctic Survey in Cambridge um, in the United Kingdom. My research interests are in developing scientific advice for policymakers in the polar regions. And my work is focused on research to support marine conservation and the sustainable use of marine resources. And that includes the development of marine protected areas. Or MPAs. I've been lucky enough to visit Antarctica nine times now, most recently um, conducting surveys of benthic biodiversity around the South Orkney Islands um, and the Northwest Weddell Sea in support of um, conservation in those regions. Um, I've been a scientific advisor as part of the UK delegation to the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, or CAMELA, which I'll talk more about later. I've had that role since about 2005, so, so a lot of time uh, working uh, within that organisation. Um, but I've recently taken up a new role leading a group within the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, or SCAR, um, which provides scientific advice to policymakers um, in the Antarctic Treaty System. So my lecture today um, is about research and monitoring in Antarctic MPAs and how science can be used to support effective marine conservation. So just to give a quick outline of um, what I'll talk about in the presentation. Firstly, to give you a little bit of background on the Antarctic Treaty System for those who might not be familiar with it. Then I'll talk about the objectives um, of Antarctic marine protected areas and what they're trying to achieve um, and some of the background to their development so far. Talk a bit about existing and also some of the proposed Antarctic marine protected areas. But what I'll focus on mostly is uh, research and monitoring plans or sometimes called RMPs, the requirements and the aims and objectives of um, RMPs, particularly in, in the Antarctic. One of the most important things is understanding and responding to change and being able to adapt to management um, in response to change. And um, so I'll talk a bit about how we can do that. Um, and I'll finish the lecture with uh, looking a little at the, the future of marine protected areas and research and monitoring plans that um, help to make them effective. What's, what's needed for the success of, of these systems. Antarctica, as you all know, I'm sure, is a continent surrounded by ocean and it's the coldest region on Earth. But despite its freezing temperatures, the, the Southern Ocean is actually one of the most productive areas on the planet and it supports a huge abundance of marine life. In a global context, the Southern Ocean is one of the least impacted by human activities, as this map shows. However, it's still under pressure from fishing, from tourism and from scientific and other human activities, as well as the most significant threat, which is a changing climate. So the Southern Ocean supports huge populations of, of Antarctic krill. This is a small crustacean that forms the basis of the Antarctic food web and it provides food for fish, seabirds, penguins, seals, whales, a whole range of, of different um, 
marine predators. And krill has been harvested in the Southern Ocean since the 1970s. And it was really concern about how this amazing food web might be affected by unregulated fishing that was the basis for negotiating a new marine resource management framework under the Antarctic Treaty System. And I'll explain a little about the Antarctic Treaty System now. So the Antarctic Treaty itself entered into force in 1961 and it sets aside any territorial claims to the continent. Crucially, it establishes Antarctica as a continent devoted to peace and to science. So Antarctica is really a, a unique natural laboratory where scientific research and cooperation between different nations is of key importance. Um, some of the instruments of, of the Antarctic Treaty System include the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, or CAMLA as it's often called, and this is responsible for the sustainable management of fishing in the Southern Ocean. In addition to this, another instrument is the Protocol on Environmental Protection, which regulates all of the other human activities in Antarctica. Now the Antarctic Treaty applies to the area south of 60 degrees south, so that's the black dashed line in this map, while CAMLA, the Fisheries Convention, applies to a wider area that extends north um, to a boundary marked with the red line in this map, um, and that approximates to the, the ecological extent of the Southern Ocean. So during this lecture I'll, I'll focus on CAMLA, as this is the part of the Antarctic Treaty System which has responsibility for establishing marine protected areas although some smaller protected areas can also be established under the environmental protocol. CAMLA currently has 26 member states, plus the EU in addition, and all of its decisions are made by consensus. Um, and that means that all members must agree in order for progress to be made. Um, the picture here is of a, a CAMLA meeting in progress. These are held usually in Hobart in Australia every year. Um, but it will be like everything else held online this year, which will certainly be an interesting experience. So the diagram on the left of the screen outlines the, the structure of CAMLA, and it shows how policy decisions made by the Commission are based very much on scientific advice provided by the Scientific Committee and its working groups. And it's, there's really that flow of scientific information through to, to policy decision-making, which is central to the way that CAMLA operates. The objective of the Convention is, is the conservation of Antarctic marine living resources and for this purpose um, the, con the term conservation in includes rational use and that means that the Convention doesn't exclude harvesting as long as that harvesting is, is carried out in a sustainable manner and it takes into account the effects of fishing on other components of the ecosystem. The Camelars precautionary ecosystem-based approach to fisheries management is set out in these principles of conservation. So these are the prevention of decrease in the size of any harvested population to levels below those which ensure that it can have stable recruitment, the maintenance of ecological relationships, so that's those relationships between the harvested species as well as those that depend upon them, and the prevention of changes or, or the minimization of the risk of changes in the marine ecosystem which can't be reversed over a period of two to three decades. To give effect to its main objective and its principles of conservation, CAMLA agrees legally binding conservation measures and these include um, measures on catch limits, on open and closed seasons, regulations of fishing gear and the methods of harvesting, general environmental protection and also the opening and closing of areas or regions for the purposes of scientific study or conservation, including special areas for protection and scientific study. And all conservation measures are adopted on the basis of the best scientific advice available. Despite this provision for protected areas to be established in, in the Convention, it wasn't until the early 2000s that CAMLA began to discuss the potential for establishing MPAs. At around this time, there was increasing international discussion on the need to develop a global representative system of MPAs and CAMLA committed to join the effort towards achieving this by 2012. The first CAMLA MPA workshop was held in 2005 and the first MPA was established at the South Orkney Islands in 2009 
Following this, Kamala defined nine MPA planning domains, which is shown in the map here. And these were designed to facilitate further work on developing MPA proposals for different regions, um, as well as a general framework also agreed in that year for establishing MPAs, which set out the, the principles and the guidelines for how that should be done. So the general framework for establishing MPAs sets out the principles by which MPA should be agreed by CAMLA, and it states that the objectives for those MPA should include the protection of representative examples of marine ecosystems, key ecosystem processes, species and habitats, scientific reference areas, areas that are vulnerable to impact by human activities, critical areas for ecosystem function, and also areas to maintain resilience or the ability to adapt to the effects of climate change. However, following this agreement of, of the general framework, um, progress on the establishment of further MPAs, um, in addition to that initial one at the South Orkney Islands, has been very, very slow. The Ross Sea Region MPA was adopted in 2016, and so you can see those two adopted MPAs on the map there in the, the lighter blue colour. But Camel has been unable to, to reach agreement on, on three other proposals um, in East Antarctica, in the Weddell Sea and in the Antarctic Peninsula. And you can see from the dates um, next to those current MPA proposals there that, that many of these have been under consideration for several years since they were first proposed. Um, there's been extensive scientific background work and consultation with NGOs and the fishing industry undertaken before the proposals were even brought forward to Kamala. Um, and that process of, of discussion um, towards trying to get agreement has, has been very, very slow. The agreement of MPA research and monitoring plans is one of the most important aspects of MPA development, but it has also been one of the biggest obstacles in the whole process of, of developing MPAs. The What's called the priority elements of a research and monitoring plan must be developed as part of the planning process and agreed at the time of MPA adoption. And the complete plan is then developed and agreed once the MPA has established, is established. But despite establishing these, these two MPAs, now at the South Orkney Islands and at the Ross Sea, um, Kamala has not yet managed to agree our MPs for either of, of these two areas. Research and monitoring plans are a very important tool to provide information for MPA reviews, which are usually required every five to 10 years. And they're a key part of ensuring effective and adaptive management. They, they aim to be an open and transparent framework under which all members can collect and access and analyze data, including relevant indicators and, and parameters. And data collected under this framework are used to evaluate the effectiveness of MPAs. So this quote from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, I think, sets out very clearly the value of research and monitoring, particularly in evaluating how species and habitats change over time um, and how this can be used to inform management decisions. I think the key here is making informed management decisions. So having the ability for, for managers to really access um, sufficient scientific information to, to be able to continue the management of these areas. I'm going to look in a little more detail now at how our MPs have been developed for the two existing Kamala MPAs. The South Orkney Islands MPA was established in 2009 and that was before any RMP was prepared as part of the first review of this MPA in 2014. And this set out um, the research relevant to the objectives of the MPA, um, the monitoring of the degree to which the, these objectives are being met and also other research which might include that um, undertaken outside the designated area. And it identified that research should address a set of general questions, um, looking at whether the boundaries continue to encompass the features associated with those objectives, trying to understand the ecosystem roles of the habitats, the processes and the species and other features protected within the MPA. And I think most importantly, looking at how those habitats and processes and other features are potentially affected by fishing, by climate change, environmental variability, or by other impacts. So the plan included um, a lot of detailed information on the research and monitoring topics designed 
to address these general questions. Um, there are just four examples given here, but there are 11 topics in total. So I won't, I won't go through these in a lot of detail. I know there's a lot of um, text on the screen, um, but this is just to give you an idea of the, the extent of the detail in these plans. Plan also included details of baseline data and key indicators that can be used to track changes in the structure and the function of the ecosystem within the NPA. So one of these indicators is shown here, the numbers of, of breeding pairs of a daily penguins at Sydney Island and Laurie Island, where there are long-term monitoring studies. Also the use of the MPA by a daily penguins during their post-breeding phase. Um, and this is done using satellite tracking information of penguins leaving their breeding sites. Another indicator is um, regional scale estimates of, of krill abundance and distribution. And this is done using acoustic surveys, both by research vessels, but also by the fishing industry itself. And variability in sea ice, which, which can be achieved using um, remote sensing approaches. We also have a, an extensive project list in the plan with details of research and monitoring on specific topics and the progress towards their completion. And again, just a few examples are given here, but there are currently 19 projects um, underway in total. This research and monitoring plan was updated for the second review of this MPA in 2019, but it's still not been agreed by Kamala. But never, nevertheless, um, research by the United Kingdom and by others has continued based on the draft plan. And this has been very successful in improving understanding of the region. Um, and confirming that the values for which it was originally designated have, have not in fact changed over, the, over that time. For example, um, a UK-led um, international benthic survey in 2016 um, aimed to improve understanding of seafloor benthic habitats around the South Orkney Islands and also the biodiversity within those habitats in relation to to the geomorphic zones both inside and outside the MPA and penguin tracking has continued um, from Signy Island on the South Orkneys um, and this has also confirmed the importance of this area for a daily penguins during winter as you can see from the tracks um, of penguins passing through um, and going inside the MPA which is marked in, in red on the bottom right hand map there. So just moving to the other side of, of the Southern Ocean now. Um, as the world's largest MPA covering over 2 million square kilometres, the Ross Sea MPA is a much larger region with considerably more complex and extensive research and monitoring requirements. The RMP for, for the Ross Sea MPA sets out research and monitoring activities according to geographic areas and it's organised around three themes which are um, shown here. So representativeness and that's to assess whether the MPA is protecting an adequate proportion of all the different the various environments in the Ross Sea region. Secondly threat mitigation and that's assessing the extent to which threats in the region are being effectively avoided or mitigating mitigated by the MPA especially where there may be a high risk from harvesting. And thirdly scientific reference areas and these are areas where there's an opportunity to study Antarctic marine ecosystems in areas where fishing is restricted um, to look at the effects of environmental variability and climate change on Antarctic marine living resources. So recognising the importance of, of keeping track of all this research and, and making the results accessible so they can be used in future MPA reviews, the Kamala Secretariat has now set up an MPA information repository and this contains information on the MPA objectives, their project lists, baseline data, uh, research themes and geographic zones. And all of this allows all members of CAMELA to easily find and, and also contribute information. So I think this is a really good step forward in, in making this um, useful for, for all of the members. I just want to talk a little bit now about research and monitoring in another very large Southern Ocean MPA, which has been established not under CAMELA, but under national jurisdiction. South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands are sub-Antarctic islands in the Southwest Atlantic region. An MPA around these islands was established in 2012, and it covers over 1 million square kilometers, including 
no take zones and seasonal closures that, that protect predator foraging areas, especially during the breeding season. The MPA also contains benthic closed areas. These are the, the green squares that you can see there, which protect vulnerable seafloor habitats from the impacts of fishing. The South Georgia MPA has a five year review period and its first review was in 2017. And over 200 scientific articles have been published on the area since the MPA was established. And also with more than 20 research cruises undertaken by the UK and by others during that period. Long term monitoring of penguins, fur seals, albatross populations has been continually undertaken here for more than 30 years. And there's extensive data on fisheries, bycatch, um, and the interaction between fisheries and the ecosystem, collected um, largely by commercial fishing vessels. Some of the recent research in the area has included um, high resolution oceanographic modeling. And so this is helping us to understand the movements and retention of krill over the South Georgia shelf. There's also been a lot of development of deep water camera systems. And that's been used to assess the status and, and the recovery of these benthic closed areas. You can see some of the fantastic underwater imagery that, that these cameras have captured. Other research, um, there's been uh, tracking of Gentoo penguins during the winter. And this is to understand the spatial overlap um, with the krill fishery, which, which only operates during the winter. There's also been a project to identify globally important bird and biodiversity areas um, using a range of different species. Um, and again, this is used to, looking, used to look at the spatial and temporal overlap between these critical areas for seabirds and potential threats from the fishery. So similar to the Ross Sea Region MPA, there's a need for tools to, to organize and, and make this very large amount of data and information accessible and, and useful for managers and for stakeholders. And I've been working on a number of projects to develop online tools to help with this. So we have an MPA data portal currently under development, and this is going to be a, a central source of information on the MPA, on its ecology, the physical environment, human activities and scientific research. And this will contain also um, links to uh, the metadata records in the UK Polar Data Centre catalogue so that people can have access to the full range of data that's available. Scientists will also be able to access information on previous and current research activities, um, including maps of vessel tracks and sample sites so that we can see where previous um, work has been done. And I think this is a really useful resource for planning future scientific studies. Another tool that we've developed is a web-based geographic information system. Um, and this provides data layers such as MPA management boundaries, um, bathymetry, sea ice information, oceanography and, and predator colonies. And again, this is very useful for stakeholders and managers or anyone who's interested to be able to, to really see a lot of these data um, on, on a very easily accessible map format. So the South Georgia MPA review um, examined changes in the scientific understanding of the area since the designation of the MPA in 2013. And based on this information, it provided advice to the South Georgia government on how well the existing MPA measures were working, as well as future research and monitoring priorities. And the government of South Georgia announced some additional MPA measures following this review in 2018. And this included some additional no-take zones to reduce overlap with predators and the winter krill fishery. Um, there were some new no-take zones for the deep south sandwich trench. There was an extension to the seasonal closure of the fishery, again, to, to ensure protection for predators during the breeding season. Um, and there was also a new prohibition on any exploration, exploitation of minerals or hydrocarbons in the area. So one of the, one of the biggest challenges facing Antarctic marine ecosystems is, is climate change. 
And we know that warming has already had an impact globally, and this is likely to continue into the future. MPAs cannot protect species and habitats completely against the effects of climate change, but they can increase their resilience to change by reducing other pressures, such as fishing, particularly in regions like the Antarctic Peninsula and the Scotia Sea, where the evidence, um, such as in these recent publications, suggests that there are likely to be cumulative impacts. Understanding the effects of change and, and the projections of how these effects are likely to develop into the future is critical for ensuring conservation success in the long term. For example, um, this recent research, um, this is by a colleague at the British Antarctic Survey, has highlighted the, the likely shifts in the distribution of seafloor species with projected temperature increases during the next century. You can see that there's a lot of change of, of species um, moving from either further south in response to a changing temperature or perhaps uh, disappearing altogether. Um, similarly, um, another modelling study has identified how ecologically important areas for marine predators like penguins, seabirds and seals are likely to change over time, particularly with changes in the distribution and availability of, of their prey species, um, primarily krill. So in figure one, the, the larger figure at the top there, the, the white outlines on the map show areas of ecological significance for these species, and the, the pink polygons uh, show existing and proposed MPAs. Um, in figure four, um, so the smaller map uh, down on the left, the blue areas remain important as areas of ecological significance, so certainly some of them are likely to stay the same. But you can see that the, the orange areas on the edges and around the continents indicate where these ecologically important areas have been lost, and green are where these areas may have shifted into, um, into new regions. So I think this demonstrates really clearly the need for management to be adaptive, to be able to respond to change and potentially to make adjustments to MPA boundaries in, in the future. So I'd like to just um, end the lecture here by looking ahead to some of the challenges for research and monitoring in protected areas, particularly in relation to a changing environment and how these might be met by improving collaboration and also the use of a lot of new technology which is becoming available. Establishing MPAs with this regular and evidence-based review is very much needed to ensure conservation success in the long term. And in order to achieve this, um, key actions will include a whole ecosystem approach to conservation, which is already a key camera objective. It's important to have consultation and collaboration across stakeholder groups, and this makes the process very much stronger. I think what's also critical is the engagement of all CAMELA members in the development of RMPs and also in undertaking research activities. Up until now, it's very much been a smaller group of, of CAMELA members which have proposed MPAs and then continued to do the work in support of them. But I think as CAMELA as a whole has committed to um, trying to achieve this, this system of MPAs, it's, it's really critical that all members are engaged in that process. And I think we can get um, very much more valuable research inputs by having uh, more of those members involved and, and using, contributing their expertise. In addition, we can get a fantastic research contribution from the fishing industry. This is increasingly um, providing really excellent data that's, that's very relevant here. Investment in research to support the MPA objectives and including some new technologies, which I'll talk about in a, in a, in a moment, um, is also really important. And then, as I've shown with some of these new tools for sharing data, um, access to information for decision makers and for stakeholders is also really very important. And finally, the use of this new information to respond to change is, is key to the whole um, system remaining effective into the future. I think we need to be willing to, to look at new information and um, to make this available for decision making 
and to allow the system of marine protected areas to be adjusted or updated um, as we see this change continuing to happen into the future. So just to finish, um, there is a huge range of developing technology and, and new approaches that I think will really improve the ability of CAMLA and its members to, to undertake research and monitoring for MPAs. We have a new generation of polar research vessels. Um, the picture here is um, showing the, the new um, UK research vessel, which is, is very close to completion now. This is going to be called the Sir David Attenborough. Um, and this is a fantastic new vessel that will have a loss of um, increased capability. Um, and we're seeing additional vessels from China, from Australia, from Germany, um, lots of these new vessels with, with really improved capability um, are going to be starting to work in the Antarctic in the next few years. As I said earlier, fishing vessels have also um, continued to engage more with Camelot Science in recent years and they, they provide an excellent platform for research, um, for example undertaking acoustic surveys for krill. Satellite remote sensing is, is becoming cheaper, higher resolution, um, easier to access, and ecosystem modeling and improved climate projections can help with understanding how species and habitats are likely to respond to change. We have um, remotely operated and autonomous vehicles which are becoming much more accessible and widely used. And um, one example is the the sail buoy, which you can see this little, uh, looks like a small boat in the bottom picture here. Um, this has been developed in collaboration with the Norwegian krill fishing industry to, to be able to undertake oceanographic and acoustic surveys um, remotely without the need for um, an expensive uh, research cruise and a, a vessel to, to be down there. So I think this will really change things in terms of how much information is available. Um, the other technology that I think has grown enormously in recent years is new camera systems. Um, and we have lots and lots of um, amazing ability to, to get uh, visual, visual imagery, um, everything ranging from deep water long lines um, onto monitoring penguin colonies with remote cameras um, all year round. So there are so many different technologies there. Um, I think it's clear that, that this is a, an exciting time for Antarctic research. Um, there is a lot to, to learn sure, for sure, um, but I hope that's given you just a small idea of um, some, of the, um, some of the aims and objectives of, of what CAMELA is trying to do with MPAs. Um, and I'm very happy to answer any questions on any of that. So thank you very much again for the invitation to speak to you today and, and for your attention. Um, my particular thanks to the translator, to Andre for his amazing work in, in translating for me today. Um, and I'm very happy, as I said, to answer any questions. So thank you very much. Spasiba. Dear colleagues, you may ask your questions in any language and we are going to interpret them. The first comment is, thank you very much for your lecture. A number of countries have uh, suggested new MPAs and most of them uh, also overlap with the territorial claims of these countries. Is it just a mere coincidence or after the end of the um, uh, Antarctic Treaty that will be one of the factors regarding the division of the Antarctic continent? Thank you for the question. I think it's a very good one. Um, yes, you are you are right that um, I think a lot of the a lot of the work um, towards the development of protected areas is inevitably undertaken in the areas where different countries have their research interests and their historical areas of operation and their research um, stations, for example. Um, so, for example, in you know, the, the UK, most of the UK scientific operations are in the, the Southwest Atlantic sector. That's where our um, understanding, our, our scientific um, expertise is the greatest. Um, and yes, it does, it does overlap with a, a territory that, that is claimed by the UK. And that's similar for other countries as well. Um, I think, though, having said that, um, 
it is very much an objective of Camelot as a whole that's agreed that for the whole Southern Ocean, regardless of any territory, um, it is really very important that, that we ensure that protection is in place for, for all of the important um, features of the Southern Ocean, that we want to protect it for everyone's use as, as far as possible. The Antarctic Treaty, as you know, does put all of those territorial claims um, on hold, it puts them to the side. And I, you know, my, I very much hope that, that that situation will continue long into the future. Um, there's nothing um, to suggest that the Antarctic Treaty will stop existing. Um, and I think um, it, it will hopefully continue in, in the spirit of having collaboration and uh, this kind of international effort to, to protect the continent, um, regardless of, of the nationality. But thank you for the question. Thank you very much for your answer. Colleagues, we are waiting for your questions in any languages. We are ready to take them. Yes. Susie, in comments, there is a question in English. Uh, shall I read it or will you read it yourself in the chat? Uh, is this the question from Vasily? Gr uh, greetings, uh, Susie. This is Vasily Spiridonov Moscow. <laughs> Most of proposed Antarctic MPs are outside of any activity. The Western Antarctic Peninsula is in our story. How you imagine establishing an MP there? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and hello, Vasily, it's very nice to see you. Um, we shared a ship several years ago uh, in the, uh, near the South Orkneys on their research cruise. So it's, it's really great to see you again. <laughs> Um, and thank you for the question. I think the Antarctic Peninsula is, you're absolutely right, this is a unique place. It is another story. Um, and I think um, establishing an MPA there has a particular challenge because of the very complex um, range of human activities, um, not just fishing, also a lot of uh, tourism activities, a lot of scientific research. Kamala is, has been working very hard on, on this for a number of years um, and at the moment the, the focus is really on how to manage the major fishery or the only fishery in this region which is the, the quill fishery um, and how to um, distribute the catch of quill around that area in such a way that it minimizes the risk to predators and um, to, to penguins particularly um, seals and um, Wales in this region. Um, and I think when more progress has been made on that, I think it will become easier then to um, design a network of protected areas which can act, I think, very importantly as reference areas um, for the fishery so that we can help to, to um, gather the data that's required for that fishery management to respond to change because it is such a rapidly changing region. Um, but also, it's not, it's not only about um, protecting areas from fishing, there are also other reasons for protection, um, for example, protecting particularly vulnerable um, deep sea or benthic habitats, um, where there are some very unique um, uh, species, sponges and so on, which, which could be um, under threat from future activities. So I think you're right, it's, it's extremely complicated. I think that area will take a very, very long time for all of these different um, components to fit together um, and to come up with a, a sensible plan for how it should best be protected. But I think what's encouraging really in that region is the collaboration between a lot of different countries and between a lot of different um, groups interested in different aspects. And I think that's been very positive throughout the process that's happened so far on, on developing proposals for this area. So I hope that that will continue. Susie, uh, пока еще коллеги... Susie, while my colleagues are still thinking, I'm going to ask a question myself. I think it will be important. How do you think? Can we use the research and monitoring plans to bring together and 
unite our approaches to all the MPAs, to establish some criteria and create a, an integrated monitoring system over the whole Antarctic nature. Yeah, I, I hope so. I, I think that's a that's a a really excellent um, um, aim to try to do that. Um, I think up until now, um, research and monitoring plans have been developed in quite different ways because they've been developed by different groups or, or different CAMLA members. I think it is important that they have their own characteristics to some extent. I think we know that a lot of these regions are very different. They're different ecologically. I mean, for example, from the, the Ross Sea to the South Orkney Islands is, is a very different um, environment. But I think different MPAs are also different to each other in terms of um, the practicalities of undertaking research in different places. And a lot of that will depend on the existing research infrastructure in a certain area. And I think we have to be realistic about the fact that that will be different in different places um, and not to expect too much. I think um, a risk with the development of research and monitoring plans is if we try to make them all do the same thing, that will just be impossible in some areas. And so you set the um, requirements too high and it then becomes unachievable. Um, and so I think we do need to be realistic and, and practical about what's achievable in, in different places. But I do agree with you that I think these plans are a, a really good opportunity to identify what's important, what we need to know about the marine environment in order to manage and protect it effectively. So yes, I think there is certainly a lot of scope to, to try to bring this together and have some some more general principles for how, how this should be done. It, it is something that, that Kamala has been trying to do. Um, again, it's been done um, in quite a slow way, but I, I would hope that that, that is an ongoing um, objective that they'll try to achieve. Thanks for the question. Thank you very much for such a detailed answer. It's very important for us to understand that uh, all the MPAs are different from each other and everywhere the marine life is different. That is why we have to study them in a different way. The next question is as follows. How often do you have research in the already created MPAs? How often does the monitoring take place there? Um, Again, it, it depends a lot on the area. Um, so the, the th I guess the three examples that, that I talked about for the South Orkneys, um, it's, it's really quite difficult to get there. Um, uh, on, well, the expedition that, that Vasily and I were both on, it, you know, that was one of the few, the very few research cruises to, to look at the benthic environment in that region. Um, it, is, it is very difficult to, to get the the funding to um, take a research cruise um, to new areas. And I think that's a, that's a real issue that we have to, to be conscious of. Um, there are certainly some areas in, in the Ross Sea, um, in South Georgia as well, where, where long-term monitoring programs have been in place for, for many years and they can provide really excellent data. Um, and some of that data is, is um, annual and, and it will be ongoing. Um, I do think that some of these new technologies, especially the remote sensing or um, autonomous uh, vehicles, will help us to, to have better time series of, of data that will mean that we can understand these areas without having to visit them all the time or every year even, because that is difficult and, it, and it's variable between regions as well. Uh, thanks. It is possible that countries that have not ratified the MPA agreement could increase their fishing in the absence of competition. Um, sorry, I missed that. Is, is it possible? That Just like <laughs> Japan continues failing. Okay. Um, it is possible and there is some uh, still some um, problems with um, illegal fishing operating in the Southern Ocean. It's it's such a huge area that it's very difficult to to monitor the whole region um, and to make sure that that doesn't happen. So yes, it, it is possible, but I think um, 
increasingly Kamala is doing a really a good job of, of preventing that um, uh, fishing outside of its regulations. Um, I think if if there are countries who are not members of Kamala who um, are fishing in these regions that there would be a lot of pressure on those countries um, by the by Kamala and its members um, to to join the convention and and to to kind of take part in that. Um, so yes, it's possible, but I, I think it's it, the possibility is it seems to be decreasing. Um, hopefully, with, with some of the measures that have been put in place now. Thank you very much, Susie. Thank you to you, and I would like to thank you once again for having found time to join us and share this information about uh, camel MPAs. Uh, such discussions are key for us to move on. Thanks a lot to everyone and we'll see you again. Thank you all again. Thank you very much. Indeed, we have many questions today. Thank you, Susie, for your time. Thank you, Yelena, for moderation. We will publish the questions and answers on the related page soon. We would like to say thank you to our dearest partners, the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, for their help in developing the lecture topics. We have a short break right now, and we welcome our next guest at 11 o'clock.